statement that defines to be performed. Então, na data da reunião de hoje, né, é, na data de hoje, é, às 9 horas e agora 9 horas e 5 minutos, é, a comissão julgadora é, que eu vou falar a seguir né, está presente para a defesa de tese de doutorado de, em oftalmologia e ciências visuais é, da aluna é, doutora Marina Rosenblatt, sobre o título External Factors Related to Hand Improve uh, Dexterity Analyzed by an Ophthalmic Microsurgical Simulator, The Principles for Improving Skills in Vitro Retinal Surgery. Uh, so, uh, this commission uh, is uh, constituted by the uh, following uh, professors. Uh, Professor Carlos Augusto Moreira Jr., which is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology of uh, Federal University of Paraná State. Uh, Professor Márcio Guitar Nehemi, which is a chairman, who is a chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology of uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais. Uh, Professor Marcos Pereira Ávila, uh, which is the chairman of the uh, Federal University of Goiás, uh, and our uh, international guest, uh, friend, everybody is our friend, but uh, Peter made a lot of efforts, Professor Peter, a lot of efforts in order to get Marina in the position that she is in this moment. So Professor Dr. Peter Gilba, which is professor, who is professor of the Department of, of, of Ophthalmology from the Wilmer Institute uh, at the Johns Hopkins uh, University. Uh, so I'm going to change to Portuguese again. Uh, como presidente uh, dessa banca examinadora, eu vou iniciar essa sessão. Depois eu uh, vou repetir em inglês para os nossos colegas do exterior que estão nos ouvindo, né? É, e a Marina, ela dispõe, a candidata Marina, dispõe de um período de tempo entre 30 e 50 minutos para expor a sua tese. Em seguida, nós faremos a arguição uh, da candidata. Então, eu vou falar isso em inglês, Marina, antes, né? E depois fazer uns agradecimentos antes... Uh, de que você inicie, ok? Uh, so, uh, Marina will have 30 to 35 to 50 minutes to uh, give his lecture uh, about the thesis. And after that, uh, the professors, uh, Carlos Moreira Jr., Marcio Bittarne Remy, Marcos Avila, uh, Peter Gelbach, are going to uh, uh, make some questions uh, to Marina. Uh, this question, uh, these questions uh, will, uh, each of the examiners will have uh, 30 minutes uh, for these questions uh, and also uh, Marina for the replies, okay? These questions may uh, be performed as a kind of dialogue, uh, talking with Marina, which is what we uh, suggest to be done, or uh, make a lot of questions. She's going to write all the questions and reply all the questions. Uh, after doing that, uh, we are going to another room uh, which is a, obviously a virtual room, and we are going to decide uh, if Marina is approved or not. Uh, before Marina starts, I, I would like to tell some words. I'm thankful for all the colleagues uh, involved in this study. Many colleagues here, many fellows, uh, many residents, uh, especially the members of our Department of Ophthalmology here, uh, 
the colleagues that are going to analyze the thesis uh, and our great friend, uh, Professor uh, Peter Gelbach. Uh, actually, uh, it's very important to say a few words about uh, Michelle Farah and Ana Luisa Hoffman Lima, as well as Rubens Belfort Jr. Uh, they uh, created the environment and uh, the possibility for us in order to do this study. So I'm thankful uh, to Michelle, to Ana Luisa, to Rubens Belfort, who gave us uh, with uh, um, partnership with the company, uh, private-public partnership, uh, the simulators with the Latino Pharma Company in order to make this uh, study feasible. Uh, we believe this kind of uh, interaction of the public uh, universe in Brazil and the private uh, companies are a key to make the university more uh, more uh, efficient uh, and also uh, to give new insights uh, and uh, improve the science in our country. So uh, after these few words, I would like to ask to Dr. Marina Rosenblatt, who did a lot of efforts in order to finish this thesis to present the data uh, in 35 to 50 minutes for us. Marina, please uh, share your screen and show your wonderful uh, lecture, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for our, all the Brazilian and American colleagues and mentors. Uh, another person I would like to thank for joining us today is Professor Julian Yordashita. He is the main professor of the engineering school at Johns Hopkins University. But it's a pleasure to have you all today with us. So now I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, perfect. Okay, so, all right, I'm gonna start now. So good morning, everyone. My name is Marina Roisenblatt. First, I would like to thank the committee members and everybody else who is attending this talk, which is gonna be presented for the defense of my PhD thesis. This presentation is entitled External Factors Related to Hand Dexterity Analyzed by an Ophthalmic Microsurgical Simulator, Principles for Improving Skills in Vitro Retina Surgery. My advisor, I would like to thank him, is Dr. Mauricio Maia, and I would also like to thank my co-advisors, which are Dr. Michelle Farah and Dr. Rubens Belfort, Jr. This study was financially supported by the following institutions, CAPIS, IPEPO, Latino Pharma, and the Lehman Foundation. And there is no financial disclosures relevant for this talk. We had the opportunity to publish our data in some high impact international journals, such as Germ Ophthalmology, Retina, and the Journal of Psychiatric Research. And we also presented our findings in some major international meetings, like the Retina Society, Macula Society, AAO. So we really have received a nice feedback from the scientific community so far. All right, and this is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm gonna give a brief introduction on the topic. Then we are gonna discuss each paper separately. And finally, we will go to the main conclusions. So starting with the introduction part, we all know that pars plana vitrectomy 
has been considered the first treatment option for a number of retinal conditions. And although this technique now is considered safer, faster, more efficient, and requires less effort to be performed, there are still many challenges associated with vitrectomy. And those challenges, they usually come from the human physiologic limits, like our inability to sense micro forces, the human fatigue, or some limitations related to hand dexterity. In this figure here, can you see my pointer here? Is it possible to see the pointer? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes, it's perfect. Okay. So uh, this figure was published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology by our group. And we are illustrating the importance of the hand tremor here. So that the amplitude, the diameter of the red sphere here represents the amplitude of the physiologic hand tremor. And the dimension of the axis down here corresponds to the total retina thickness. And the main point here is that the amplitude of the physiologic hand tremor represents more than a half of the total retina thickness, as you can see here. In addition, we all know that the surgical performance of the novice surgeons may vary, affecting their early surgical outcomes. And the steep learning curve associated with vitrectomy result from many factors, including those that are modifiable and those that are essentially unmodifiable. And consistent with this goal of improving surgical dexterity, we saw the emergence of virtual training simulators, which provide a feedback on parameters that allow the quantification of surgical dexterity. And a good example is presented here is the IC platform. This software was first developed as a vitro retina training system and then developed for anterior segment simulations. And it allows in training surgeons to develop intraocular technique mm -hmm. in a control environment, but also it allows the experienced ophthalmologists the opportunity to maintain and to improve their surgical skills. And regarding those modifiable factors we said before, the current literature in the non-ophthalmologic surgical field recommends surgeons who wish to optimize their surgical dexterity that we should avoid caffeine intake or any other psychostimulant drug before doing a surgical procedure. In addition, the alcohol intake physical exercise or sleep deprivation should also be avoided according to this literature. And the beta blockers, for instance, propanolol, are being studied also for a potential association in neutralizing tremor and surgical anxiety. However, there is no previously published data on those factors, on the impact of those factors on the vitro retina field. I just want to emphasize that the vitro retina surgery is an area, it's a field that requires microsurgical precision and accuracy. In addition, there is no published data, there is no previous study analyzing all those factors together on the performance of the same surgeon. And the literature also lacks a sleep recorded study on surgical dexterity when the surgeons are exposed to sleep deprivation. So based on that, the goal of the present thesis was to perform a comparative analysis of all those factors together on the surgical dexterity of the same surgeon using the posterior model of the IC surgical simulator. All right, and now we are gonna start discussing each paper separately. 
But first of all, I just want to emphasize that all papers and all studies were previously approved by the Ethical Committee of Brazil and uh, informed consents were obtained from all participants of the study. Good. So starting with study number one, this study was published in JAMA Ophthalmology and it was considered what they call the most read papers by the readers for two consecutive weeks in this high impact journal. So we were very impressed by the result and the interest of the people on this subject. And the goal of this study was to establish a weight adjusted cutoff for caffeine and beta blocker, in this case, propanolol that we use, intake to determine their interactions in association with the performance of the novice VR microsurgeons. This is the methodology we use not only for study number one, but also for study number two. So we selected a fixed sequence of seven simulation tests, all from the posterior model of the IC surgical simulator. And this sequence was established to be repeated throughout the study protocol. And then we recruited 15 VR fellows, all with less than two years of surgical experience. Just a second here. Oh, the slide is not progressing, just a second. Uh, uh, Marina, maybe if you touch in the center of the slide, it will move. Try it with the cursor. Okay, I'm trying that. Just, uh, just for you to think about what I said before, and then I'm going to keep going. <laughs> uh, actually, you may, also uh, you, you may also disconnect and... Uh, uh, Stop sharing and come back sharing. again, yeah. Share again, please. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's actually a very good idea, but the cursor is not appearing here for some reason. Just a second, guys. Okay, let's see here. So, yeah. Give me a second here. This uh -huh. happens. In yeah, all... and I trained many times, as you can imagine, this talk, but... I don't know if this happens. Yeah, just a second. Part of yeah. the show. So I'm going to call my assessor here, <laughs> my mom, just to help me. So, yeah, you see that the pointer is not showing up here. Uh, thank you. Yes, can you see me? But the pointer is not showing up. Você não está aqui. Aqui, esse, esse aqui, esse aqui tem que clicar. Nesse. I don't have the point of view. Então, vai ficar assim. Deu certo. Aqui ele não funciona, assim, mas... Pode clicar aqui. Certo. So... I'm so sorry, just give me a few moments. I'm gonna solve this issue pretty quick, okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry about no that. Okay, I think I'm back now. Okay. okay, now it's gonna work. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna sharing. start sharing again. Okay, I just wanna see if it works now.
Just gonna just give me a few moments here. Is there? And first quit, and I'm gonna first quit here. Okay, now it's gonna work. Okay, it's just loading the talk. And then I'm gonna come back to the point where I stop now. So share screen, share. All right, can you see my slides? Perfect, yes. perfect. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I'm gonna uh, start video now. All right, so I'm going to keep going. Is it okay? I'm going to keep from the same slide. Okay, that's perfect. As everything in your life, <laughs> you overcome all, all the difficulties. Go ahead, Marina. Okay, perfect. So let's keep going. So this was the methodology we used for study number one. So this study follow a prospective cross-sectional design and for the inclusion criteria, we had people with less than two years of real surgical experience and people with more than two hours of experience with IC platform. And this was done in order to avoid bias due to a learning curve. And for the exclusion criteria, we had people uh, which had any previous systemic disease or a caffeine intake greater than two 25 milliliters cup of espresso a day. And I just wanna emphasize that in order to guarantee the study safety, we perform an ECG and a 0.6 milligrams per kilo dose of propanolol for all participants in order to uh, guarantee this study safety. All right. And this was the methodology we used for study number one. So study number one was performed in over two non-consecutive days of analysis and five simulations were done by day. So the research team gave to each participant a placebo, caffeine, or propanolol pills, all of which were visually identical, making this a single blinded study. And the caffeine and the propanolol dose based on weight was done in accordance with previously published data. So as you guys can see over here, there was a baseline simulation at the beginning of each day of analysis, followed by the placebo intake, and then an increasing dose of each exposure of that day was performed. So for day one, we had caffeine in a dose of 2.5 milligrams per kilo, followed by caffeine in the high dose of five milligrams per kilo. And for day two, we had the propanolol in the low dose of 0.2 milligrams per kilo, and then the high dose of 0.6 milligrams per kilo. And by the end of the sequence, we had the neutralizing factor, which was propanolol for day one and caffeine for day two. All right. And this is the graphic we publish in journals. So this graphic is showing that we found a negative association with the VR fellows performance after the exposure to an increasing dose of caffeine as demonstrated here. And uh, the opposite phenomenon was observed after the propanolol intake, as you can see here. So if we take this point here on the graphic, which represents 0.2 milligrams per kilo of propanolol, meaning 14 milligrams of propanolol for a person weighing 70 kilos, 
This point here was associated with a better IC generated score as compared to 2.5 milligrams per kilo of caffeine. But the most interesting finding here was the potentially neutralizing effect of taking both exposures together in a way that the surgeon was able to come back to his baseline performance. So I'm going to give a practical example here. If you are a young surgeon and you were feeling tired this morning and then you decided to take a cup of coffee before your first surgical procedure of that day, you can potentially neutralize the caffeine intake by taking a dose of 0.6 milligrams per kilo of propanolol in a way that you are going to come back to your baseline performance. So in conclusion, for study number one, had I isolated 0.2 milligrams per kilo of propanolol before performing a surgical procedure was associated with an enhanced performance among the novice surgeons and the opposite phenomenon was observed with the isolated 2.5 milligrams per kilo dose of caffeine. Regarding the high dose now, we saw that the novice uh, vitreal retinal surgeons who ingested five milligrams per kilo of caffeine before doing the surgical procedure could potentially benefit from receiving a partially neutralizing dose, as we said before, of, of 0.6 milligrams per kilo of propanolol. However, the expected beneficial of caffeine and propanolol combination was no greater as compared to the, to the surgeon's baseline performance. In a way that the surgical performance after receiving both five milligrams per kilo and 0.6 milligrams per kilo of propanolol was still inferior as compared to receiving 0.2 milligrams per kilo of propanolol alone. And then we go to study number two. And this study was recently published in Retina. And the goal of the study was to quantitatively analyze and compare the novice VR surgeon's performance after various types of external exposures. So now we decided to add more variables in this equation. And the methodology was pretty similar to study number one. The only difference here is that we now included as an exclusion criteria an alcohol intake greater than three standard drinks a day. All right, and this was the design for study number two. So different from study number one, this study was performed in over five days of analysis. And for days one and two, again, the single blinded exposure to caffeine and propanolol was done in the visually identical pills, but we didn't have the neutralizing factor on the end of the exposure. So this was different from study number one. And then, the, uh, then an, an, uh, for day three, an increasing dose of alcohol was performed and an FDA approved breath analyzer used to estimate the brief alcohol concentration presented here as the PAC. So again, we tried to use two cutoffs. Uh, the first one was 0.06 to 0.10%, and the second one, 0.11 to 0.15% of this BAC. And then we go to day four. On day four, the goal of adjusting the exercise load based on weight was done by using push-ups as the upper limb exercise modality. And then we established again two cutoffs. The first one was 50% of the repetition maximum of each participant. And the second one, 85% of the repetition maximum. And finally, for day five, we perform a polysonographically recorded night of three hours sleep deprivation and then the simulation was done on the next day at 7 a.m. and then compared to the subject baseline performance. All right. And in this box plot here, 
I'm presenting the data we obtained with this study. So I'm showing the performance, the score, the subject obtained after each increasing exposure for the same for the same factor in terms of the total score, the tremor specific score, the intraocular pathway and the time. But I'm going to detail this data a little bit more on the next two slides. In this slide here, I'm showing the comparison of performance data between different levels of the same exposure. So this was very interesting. So as you as you can see here, when we analyze the alcohol intake, we saw that the, the low dose of alcohol exposure, meaning 0.06 to 0.10% of BHC, was associated with a higher tremor amount as presented here, and an increasing dose of 0.11 to 0.15% of BAC was not only associated with a higher tremor amount, but also with a lower total score on IC simulators. And then we go to propanolol. Propanolol in the low dose of 0.2 milligrams per kilo was associated with a reduction in intraocular pathway. And then in the high dose, it was associated with a shorter uh, time for test completion. And finally, for caffeine, something interesting happened. So our low dose of caffeine, meaning 2.5 milligrams per kilo, was associated with a reduced intraocular pathway However, it was not associated with a better surgical score at all. And then when we take the high dose of caffeine, it was not uh, associated with this reduction in intraocular trajectory as we saw before in the low dose. And now in this slide, I'm presenting the comparison of the median delta of performance between different exposures. If we take here, the comparison between alcohol versus propanolol. Propanolol was associated with a better surgical dexterity for all the outcomes we evaluated, which were the total score, the time for test completion, the intraocular pathway, and the tremor amount. And then going to the comparison between alcohol versus caffeine, we saw that caffeine in our low dose was associated with a reduction in both intraocular pathway and time for test completion. But the same caffeine, when, they, when you compare to, a, to the propanolol exposure, caffeine similar to study number one was associated with a lower total score uh, as compared to the propanolol exposure. And this was the, the, were the conclusions we had for study number two. So for propanolol, we saw that the beneficial propanolol association with surgical dexterity was evident when compared to an impairment after caffeine or alcohol. For caffeine, we saw that the dose of 2.5 milligrams per kilo negatively affected surgical dexterity uh, compared to the improvement after propanolol. For alcohol, there was, uh, this was the only factor analyzed that had uh, independent, dose dependent alcohol effect on surgical simulated performance among the novice surgeons. And also very interesting regarding exercise and sleep deprivation, we saw no change in surgical performance among the novice surgeons after a short session of upper limb physical exercise or after one night of three hour sleep deprivation. <clears throat> and then finally, study number three. So this was published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, which is considered a high impact journal in the psychiatric field. And the goal of this study was to numerically quantify ophthalmic microsurgical simulator performance and fine motor deficiencies among 24 chronic cocaine users and 24 sex and age match controls. 
And the methodology we used for the study number three was totally different from study number one and two. So this was a case control study for the inclusion criteria we had. People who were exposed to cocaine for more than two years, this of course was to be included in the study group. And for the control group, we had sex and age match controls. And then for the exclusion criteria, we decided to exclude anyone which had any neurologic or psychiatric disease or an exposure to drugs other than cocaine, marijuana, or alcohol within one month period before the study. Meaning that if the subject was exposed to alcohol or marijuana in the previous month, this was not considered as an exclusion criteria for any of the two groups. And we also excluded any healthcare provider from the analysis. And for study three, uh, we selected the three easiest tests available on the IC surgical simulator since we were dealing with non-physicians, non-healthcare providers. And then again, we recruited 24 chronic cocaine users and 24 age and, med, uh, age and sex match controls for this study. And this was the data we obtained for study number three. So this was pretty nice. Take a look here. So the chronic cocaine users, they presented a lower score for by manual tests for tests that require the coordination of both the upper and lower limb and for the overall score of all three tests. And then we decided to subdivide the cocaine group in two subgroups, which were people who were exposed to cocaine on the previous month and people who were not exposed to cocaine. And then we found an independent difference in the comparison between the controls and people who were exposed to cocaine on the previous month for by manual tests. And in this box plot here, I'm just showing what we have discussed before. So in part A, we see that the chronic cocaine users presented a lower total IC generated score as compared to the controls we selected. And for part B, although there was no statistically significant difference in the comparison between people who were exposed to cocaine on the previous month and controls in terms of the total score of all three tests, there was a trend, as you can see here, for a difference for a lower score in the group that was exposed to cocaine on the last month. So the p-value that we obtained in this comparison was equal to 0 0.065. And now the conclusions for study number three now. Uh, so the chronic cocaine users presented a dexterity impairment in executing fine manual tests as measured by, by manual tests or maneuvers that required simultaneous coordination of upper and lower limbs. And these deficits were specially pronounced when cocaine use occurred during the one month period before the simulation. And a, a great discussion would be also that the intervention for functional assessment of chronic cocaine users daily activity that required both hands coordination associated or not with lower link movement would be a rational and potentially valuable therapeutic approach meaning that maybe we should also consider the motricity in the rehabilitation process of those subjects. And also, we could extrapolate our data saying that fine motor impairment could be a potential concern in the setting of drug impaired physicians engaged in microsurgery. And now the conclusions. So the main conclusions were, for study number one, 
we had that novice vitro retina surgeons who ingested five milligrams per kilo of caffeine before doing a surgical procedure could benefit from receiving a partially neutralizing dose of 0.6 milligrams per kilo of propanolol. For study two, there was a dose-dependent alcohol effect on performance and the beneficial propanolol association with surgical dexterity was evident when compared to the impairment after caffeine or alcohol intake. And there was no change, as we said before, in the surgical performance after an acute night of three hours sleep deprivation or after a short session of upper limb physical exercise. And now for study three, finally, we saw that the chronic cocaine users presented a bimanual dexterity impairment in executing fine manual tests as measured by bimanual tests or maneuvers that require simultaneous coordination of both the upper and the lower limbs. And as we said, maybe we could extrapolate the data saying that fine motor impairment could be a potential concern in the setting of drug impaired physicians engaged in microsurgery. But for uh, technical issues, we did not recruit physicians for this study R because it's very hard for you to find physicians which like say that they have drug problems and, and they are, have drug abuse. In this slide, I want to discuss some strengths and some limitations of our study. So regarding the strengths for study number one and two, uh, both of them follow a prospective and self-control design, and both use a homogeneous sample of novice VR surgeons. All were fellows and all had less than two years of surgical experience. And as far as we know, this was the first protocol published that used a weight-adjusted design to assess the pharmacologic intervention and behavior inter intervention in the surgical dexterity. In addition, placebo, caffeine, and propanolol exposures were all single-blinded. As we said, visually identical pills were used. And finally, sleep deprivation was recorded objectively by using a polysonography exam. And for study three, a computerized platform was used to assign an objective numerical score to the manual dexterity of those chronic cocaine users. And then now going to the limitations, uh, for studies number one and two, the findings were restricted to novice surgeons, but as some of you guys already know, we are now repeating the same protocol in a population of senior surgeons. For study three, no physicians were recruited among, uh, uh, no physicians were recruited and the indirect conclusions attributed to them were an extrapolation of the performance data obtained among the chronic cocaine users and details on the cocaine, marijuana, and alcohol use pattern have not been investigated, meaning that we did not collect blood samples or urine samples, for instance, for those participants. And a limitation that I want to emphasize now is that there is no evidence that the simulated surgeon's performance correlates with the real world patient surgical outcomes. And this is a great, it's an important thing for us to, to, to take in mind. So as following this idea, the future directions of our study are to determine if the pharmacologic and physiologic factors that influence novice VR surgeon's performance have the same impact on senior surgeon's dexterity. And uh, to study, we, we wish to study if the IC developed skills are transferable to the real world operating theater experience with direct correlation in patient anatomic and functional surgical outcome. Because this is the main goal of our study, to be able to provide the patients a better functional and anatomical outcome by the end of the day. Maybe this is the most important slide of this presentation. 
So I really want to thank all the research participants who agreed to be part of this protocol. Without any compensation and financial incentives, uh, without their support, this whole study would simply not exist. Uh, I want to thank my advisor, Mariso Maia, my co-advisors, Rubens Belfort and Michel Farah, and all my co-authors who were by my side during this whole research process. I want to thank my dry lab team for their great effort and for their financial support as well. I want to thank uh, friends and mentors I met at Johns Hopkins University because their professional example guided me during this whole research process. And I want to thank the most important people of my life, my mother-in-law, Anita, my sister-in-law, Thais, my brother for his partnership, my cousin, Roberto, for always being there for discussing surgical and, and clinical cases with me, my husband, Arthur, for believing in me and encouraging me professionally doing this whole process. And my mom, Sueli, and my dad, Jaime, for being my big model in life and the source of inspiration throughout my life. Thank you so much for your attention. And now I'm ready for the comments and questions. Thanks a lot. Well, <laughs> wow, Marina, uh, very wonderful presentation. Actually, uh, a lot of emotion here, <laughs> uh, but the most important, which is, I believe is the most important to recognize people in our, in our way uh, and actually a high level of scientific information that we have here. Uh, actually in this uh, new <laughs> virtual life, I would like to, to acknowledge uh, Professor uh, Mitch, uh, Professor Mitchell, who is here with us and we're uh, planning um, uh, co-working studies with him, Professor Yorda Shida, uh, who is also here, uh, Professor Otaviano, who is also part of the uh, uh, colleagues that are going to make Karen answers for uh, Marina and he's going to make Karen answers if he's, he'll be able to be until the end of the, 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 the section here. Uh, Professor Nilva and many other members of our department that now are in number of 47 people in the retinal unit uh, of our department. So thanks a lot for everybody. And as part of our uh, tradition here, uh, actually, I would like to, 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 to invite for the first comments our international guest, uh, Professor Peter Luis Gelbach, a great friend who is professor of the, the Wilmer I Institute uh, at Johns Hopkins University. So, uh, Peter, you have 30 minutes for questions and also Marina, at the same time for uh, answer your questions, you can make it in dialogue or if you prefer, you can ask the questions she writes and reply all the questions. Please, my friend, go ahead and thanks for everything you have done for uh, our Department of Ophthalmology here at Federal University of Sao Paulo. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maurice. So thank you uh, to all our Brazilian friends for uh, having us here and uh, most especially to be here on this uh, uh, pretty remarkable day for Marina. She's done a terrific job, not just today, but over the, the recent years. And as you know, the, um, the PhD effort is not a impulse or inspiration that you can conquer in a week or a month that requires uh, years of commitment and dedication and as a result, the, the benefit is lifelong. Marina, I just have a few questions for you and, and they're not actually specific always to the work because we've uh, as a group gone over this in the planning phases and in the paper writing phases and then the oral examination. And so 
you have already worked through a lot of the scientific details in uh, in a thorough way and in a in a in an effective way. So, uh, with that said, um, I think I think it's clear to you now that your work has been published that it's it's high impact work. It's generated interest in the retina community, and I think that's in part because it's very relevant to uh, present issues, which are not only scientific, but social. The uh, impact of the question of alcohol use uh, on physic in physician clinical care, the, the uh, question of uh, current and past drug use uh, among physicians in clinic, uh, who are in clinical care. And actually, um, the, the question of, of performing uh, microsurgery in a less than optimized situation. So if, if you wouldn't mind, could you comment as you look to carry this work forward on some of the social aspects of the work? drug use, alcohol use, and performance enhancement versus no performance enhancement. Yeah. So Dr. Gerbach, thanks a lot for being like today and for all those years together with us in, in this project. So regarding your question, of course, there is a social impact of those exposures. But when I was doing especially the study number three, I was reading a lot this thing about the physicians being exposed to uh, a lot of work and not sleeping that much. And sometimes this brings a burnout. And based on that, some physicians start to get exposed to some situations that would not be ideal. Uh, however, uh, especially as surgeons, we are uh, put in a situation that kind of don't allow us to, to have kind of this opportunity to, to be exposed to those things that are, are not ideal, of course. Uh, so this is something that people don't tell the colleagues because otherwise they would be excluded from the surgical group. And they take a lot of time sometimes to ask for help because it's hard for them to admit they, that they are facing this kind of problem. And the big, think is that we, uh, when, ex when the surgeon is exposed to this kind of situation, he's risking the patients because he's like, he's on, not on his perfect environment to provide the best health care, as you said before. So uh, as I said in my study, we recruited patients from our psychiatric department. We did not in in involve physicians because this would be uh, especially challenging. Nobody is gonna say, okay, I'm a surgeon. I drink alcohol every day. I'm exposed to drugs and I'm ready to do this study. So this is something that people don't know, people don't share. And when the physician looks for help, it sometimes it's too late, you know, he cannot come back to this surgical field. And the people who suffer with this situation at the end of the day are the patients, of course. Hmm. Marina, do you think that, for example, physicians should be uh, breath tested before going into surgery? Yeah, this is a thing. It is a tricky question, actually, because, for instance, if you are a pilot and you are going to make like a, a, a trip, a long trip, uh, you can test the, the, the pilot in this kind of situation. Uh, so I think that this shouldn't be a routine, of course, because it's not common for people to drink before doing a surgical procedure. But if you feel like the surgeon is not on his best conditions to provide a good assistant to this, the patient, it's not about uh, brief testing, but about giving the surgeon the opportunity not to go ahead and not to do that surgical procedure, for instance, and to you know, to have like a follow-up, to give a, a, a support to this person, yeah. So um, alcohol would inhibit 
uh, surgical performance. And in some people, beta blockers would enhance performance. Do you think that if you were tested and beta blockers significantly enhanced your performance that you would have any obligation to take a beta blocker before surgery? Yeah, so this is also, uh, as you know, a lot of reviewers ask us that, that this specific question, because I think this whole study brings this question up. So I don't think that we should push our resident and fellows to take a beta blocker, because for instance, there are people who can have asthma or cardiac issues and are not allowed to take a beta blocker. But I think it's important for us to list strategies, you know, for people to be aware that there are some factors that can potentially improve and uh, to, to, or some factors that can have a negative effect on their surgical dexterity. And the surgeon is the person who is gonna select those strategies and choose which one is better for him as a own person. So there are many other variables as you know. So for instance, listening to music or like, I don't know, uh, the time of the day that you produce better. So beta blocker is not the only factor that uh, should be in this list. So you sort of touched on my next question. What, what are the next variables that you're going to examine beyond the, uh, the study in the aged surgeon? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have now validated this model to access external exposures on the performance of the VR surgeons. And this opens a whole window of opportunities to access uh, conditions and external exposures on this group of VR surgeons. So for instance, as you know, we are now repeating the whole protocol in a group of senior surgeons with more than 10 years of surgical experience. So this is gonna be the first variable that we are gonna add in the equation, the experience with the partnership with Dr. Mitch Wolf from the University of Wisconsin. We are now starting a partnership and starting to think about the ergonomic aspects of the VR surgery, because we are always in this position and maybe this can have an impact on a line uh, time analysis. And we can add like many more variables. So music, as I said before, or if the surgeon ate or fast before the surgical procedure, uh, or also how long does your surgical period takes, if it's a short or long surgical procedure uh, and so on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, changing gears a little bit, Marina. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, a PhD program has uh, many aspects to it and, and the paper writing and, and so forth. The core research is just one aspect of it. Uh, given that you're uh, at the end of a full-fledged PhD program, what would you say was the most important thing you learned from the experience? Uh, it's hard to say the most important thing, but I can list maybe a couple of things I learned. So uh, first I learned some strategies for me to improve my own surgical performance. And I think uh, we were also able to provide a list of strategies for other colleagues, for them also maybe to use them and to improve their performance in order to uh, offer a better healthcare system to our patients, because this is always the main goal. So this was the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned uh, was how important it is for you to have people that you can count on. Uh, on. Because for now we have collected, recruited uh, 26 people for this surgical, for this study. Uh, 15 fellows and 11 senior surgeons. And without their support and without they agreeing to be part of this protocol and coming for five days to the dry lab, this whole thing would not exist. Uh, so this was the second thing. And the third thing I learned, which is gonna be the last one, okay, <laughs> is uh, that uh, as you said, doing high quality research involves a lot of work. 
But when you come to the point that you manage to publish your data on a high impact journal, uh, the sensation is pretty good because you feel part of a whole team of researchers whose main goal is always the same, to improve the healthcare all over. So um, in, in the next phase of your career, you're going to uh, hopefully be uh, an MD, uh, PhD. How do you envision blending science with an increasingly busy uh, clinical and administrative career? Okay. So um, I, I think that doing our clinical trajectory, we face many questions. And the only way sometimes for you to answer those questions is coming back to research. So I, I don't think that the clinical and the research thing are antagonistic. Uh, I believe that, for instance, if you have a research career, uh, this can boost your uh, profession uh, clinically and vice versa. So I think both of them can be correlated and both of them help each other to, to be more successful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, part of that question uh, was uh, hoping that you would be seeking grant funding and building a team so that you could uh, do both uh, at the same time. But I know that that you were already working on that. Um, just a few quick uh, comments. Uh, first, uh, uh, I thought you handled the, um, the stoppage of your slides with grace. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and I'd like to compliment uh, Mauricio on intentionally stopping them to help test your, your character. Yeah, it was not expected, but <laughs> yeah. it's part of the game. As a research, as Dr. Mauricio said, it's part of the game. You need to deal with everything that appeared. Yeah, but I trained a lot before this presentation, just for you to know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so excellent. And, and then one last comment, uh, as, uh, assuming that uh, you move to full PhD, you join uh, a new family of uh, doctors who are PhD doctors and you become one of them. And as such, you have a, a family tree and that family tree includes all of the people who supported and trained the various mentors that you have. You, you are part of a very big effort that has occurred over generations of scientists and you will carry this into the next uh, generation as someone who trains and influences your students. So uh, to share with you uh, the PhD uh, branch in my family tree, which will soon be your family tree, Richard Purple was my mentor, who was the uh, head of physiology at the University of Minnesota, had a very distinguished career. He's now passed. And his uh, mentor was uh, Halden Keffer Hartline, who was Nobel Prize winner 1967 in physiology and medicine. And that's now part of your family tree. Yeah, as I always say, it's an honor to be connected to such a, a yeah, I have people who mentored me during this whole process and you were very, very important in my life, as you know, and uh, you said that the only way to get connected is to keep doing research. So my main goal is to keep doing research and to spread this network like with many more people again. Yeah. So Mauricio, thank you for allowing me to uh, examine Marina today. Oh, thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, you are a great friend. Uh, the relationship that we have at Federal University of Sao Paulo and Johns Hopkins University at Wilmer Institute is very strong. So thanks a lot for everything you, you have done for us, okay? Uh, and it's an honor and pleasure to work with you, to learn with you, and to interchange experiences. So thanks a lot for everything. So uh, actually, if you could stay here until the finish of the care and answers, uh, actually at the end, we are going to, to, to make a small meeting in another room 
uh, about Marina. And now I would like to uh, congratulate uh, your questions, very, very important, and to ask uh, Professor Carlos Augusto Moreira Jr., who is, uh, who is a chairman of the Department of uh, Ophthalmology of Federal University of Paraná State, uh, to make his comments. So, uh, Junior, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Uh, are you, can all of you listen to me? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, give you my compliments, Marina. It's a great study. It's a great work. It's a, a work with scientific contribution, especially because it has a lot of impact in our daily routine except for study number three, which is cocaine. It's not on my daily routine, but the rest, uh, all of us drink alcohol sometime or drink coffee. I'm a coffee drinker. So it has a lot of impact in our daily routine. Uh, my compliments also to your parents, uh, Jaime especially, my good friend, my colleague, uh, my compliments because many of her, their work is in your uh, daily life in your uh, uh, work uh, that show to us every day. Uh, I would like to start with a reflection to myself. I received your thesis in English. This is the first time I received a thesis for PhD, especially from uh, UNIFESP. Uh, I'm, a mem I'm a family member of UNIFESP, and this is the first time I received in English. Uh, it came to me a reflection uh, because um, a thesis has the publications, which are in English, and it's very nice, your publications, your three publications are very nice, but has also arguments uh, that you have to expose and express to us, uh, and it's important. And sometimes Portuguese is, uh, uh, is better. This is not a question for you. I think it's a question to Mauricio and to UNIFES members. And I feel uh, free to make this comment because I'm part of family, I'm part of the UNIFES family. Uh, I've been in other uh, sectors in my life. I've been into, uh, university administration as a president of a large university here in Brazil. I've been into politics as uh, secretary of state uh, of health. And one thing I found in my life is that physicians, they don't express well as well as lawyers. And mm -hmm. we always complain of that. We always say, well, the lawyers have that, the lawyers have those. But we as physicians just do the work and have hard time in expressing ourselves. And this has impact in our life. Sometimes we don't get as good uh, things as we wanted to get. Sometimes we don't uh, receive from government things that lawyers receive. And this is mainly because we express bad, not as good as lawyers. So I'm a strong defender of uh, arguing Portuguese and receiving the work in Portuguese, not all the work, just the arguments and uh, testing your capacity of expressing yourself in Portuguese. And this is just a reflection, please. It's not a question to you. It's a reflection to the Department of Ophthalmology of UNIFESP. I think we have to take care of our mother language because all of the decisions, the big decisions are in our main mother language. So I don't, for instance, I don't uh, see myself going into the Brazilian Congress and start speaking English. I don't see myself uh, having a meeting with the Ministry of Health in English. I see myself speaking Portuguese. So this is why I'm a strong defender of uh, the arguition in Portuguese. Of course, we have, of course, we have uh, 
people that are English speaking persons here as Professor Gelbach, and I understand why we are speaking in English, but this is just a reflection to the Department of Ophthalmology of UNIFESP. Going now into your work, uh, I think that surgery is a very complex task. It's not only dexterity, it's alertness, it's a strategy, and even courage, even audacity. So reducing surgery only to hand disparity, it's um, just parts, and maybe a small part of what surgery is all about. Surgery is a very complex text. So this is why I don't think robot surgery will come right uh, will come fast to your ophthalmology. I think it's gonna take a long time, maybe part as you say, well, let's remove the internal limiting membrane. Okay, this is a robot text task, but strategy, it's a human development, a human idea. So this is just a comment I would like to make about surgery. Uh, going into your, uh, first in your abstract, uh, it's a fine work, it's, a, it's really a fine work, but it's hard to understand. Uh, when I read your, your thesis, uh, I had difficulty in understanding all the points, especially methodology. And uh, this is not a, a critic, it's just a, a, a what, I, what I felt. Uh, for instance, I think age, it's an important factor in hand dexterity. Of course, you, you mentioned that all of your testing uh, subjects are young novice ophthalmic surgery, surgeons. And uh, probably they are young. But as part of your future work, I think uh, age is something important. We are very experienced surgeons here, me, Marshall, and uh, Marcus, and other people here. So we know and we felt that with age, we get experience, but we lose a little dexterity. And this is normal to everyone. So I think age is something that you, would, you should take into account. Um, the conclusion of your uh, in your abstract, it's very nice. Uh, I understood really fast and quickly. So I would like to go to the objectives and the methodology. Um, when you have the methodology, it's pretty clear to me that the subjects in, uh, had cafe caffeine and propanolol 30 to 60 minutes before the surgery before the simulator. But it's not clear to me about alcohol, okay? How long before the simulator they, in, they had alcohol intake? The second thing is that um, all of us, I, I had an experience in Chile, I, I will never forget. Uh, I was in Chile invited to do surgery and in the night before the, the surgery, they uh, made a real nice reception. And I was very young. I remember I was about 30 something years old. And we all know about Chilean wine. Chilean wine is superb. And they started to get Chilean wine to me and I drank one, one cup and one glass. And then came another guy and said, well, you have to try this another Chilean wine. This is a special rape. And I tried the second one. And after uh, maybe two or three hours, I had like a bottle and a half or something. And in the next day, when I was doing the surgery, I said, it's not myself. I, I, I don't have this hand tremor. And I said, well, this is maybe because of alcohol in in intake, alcohol ingestion. And if I had your thesis back there, I would probably take a propanolol to uh, diminish the, the tremor, but I had no idea about that. And I remember that I was not satisfied with myself because of alcohol intake the day prior. 
I'm not sure about 30 minutes or 60 minutes before the surgery, but the day prior to the surgery, alcohol, it's pretty bad to everyone. I, I'm pretty sure about that. Exercise. Uh, it depends on people. I think that uh, maybe people that are used to exercise themselves uh, will not uh, feel much. People who are not used probably will feel. Uh, I don't think a person that a surgeon that is in the academy weight uh, lift, lifting weights, uh, especially some very heavy weights, should go right on surgery in the next 15 minutes or next half hour. Uh, I think that they should rest a little while. Um, the other thing is sleep deprivation. Uh, we all know that sleep deprivation uh, impacts in your alertness, but as your thesis show, it doesn't impact in your dexterity. So um, I, I think your thesis show it really well. Coming back to alcohol, I would like to share with you a movie. I'm not, I'm not sure if uh, the people in the hearing that's with us have seen this movie. It's called The Experiment. It's a Swedish movie. And three professors, they uh, decided to check the impact of alcohol intake in the daily life. And they start to uh, having alcohol right uh, in breakfast, then in, at lunch, then uh, at dinner. And it's a very nice movie, I think. I saw uh, that movie, yeah, about the professors, huh? right? About the professors, right? That they yeah, started you, taking you, you watch yeah, movie? I saw that. Have you watched it? Yeah, yeah, very, I did. It's very nice. It's even funny. But uh, I think uh, alcohol has a big impact in all of them, in all of, on all of us. Um, I checked other things here. Let me. Uh, okay. Uh, when you talk about the dose of cafe caffeine and alcohol, I think the good thing of your thesis is that you bring to practice um, what is uh, 2.5 milligrams of caffeine, 5.0 milligrams of caffeine. And it's, if we, we go to our daily life, it's small quantities of coffee. Uh, for instance, I drink espresso maybe two or three cups every day. And uh, people, in Brazil, they drink a lot of coffee. Even in the United States, uh, I had friends in the United States that drink much more coffee. So uh, the caffeine impact is really great. And it's not something that the surgeon should just uh, forget. About alcohol, uh, it was not clear to me. What is, uh, it's about two large glasses of wine to have the BAC, uh, uh, quantity that you, you mentioned, is, is that it, Marina? Two, two large glasses of wine? Yeah, uh, Professor, it depends, actually. We started with two glasses, but in order to weight adjust the amount of alcohol intake, we were always adjusting by the, uh, the brief analyzer. You know what I mean? It, it was not a fixed dose of alcohol intake. Uh, the person was supposed to be taking the alcohol, alcoholic drink in order to reach this specific BAC. When he reached the BAC, he was ready to perform the simulation. Okay, so, uh, so this is a very fine work. I, I want to compliment you again. Uh, much of the questions that I would like to ask Professor Peter Gelbert asked about your future and research and those things. But uh, I would uh, give my final comment, uh, comp uh, saying that you had a great work, as I said, and uh, asking Mauricio and the Department of Ophthalmology of Unifest that don't forget about uh, mother tongue Portuguese. Uh, this is something that, you know why Rubens Belfort is so successful? You know, Mauricio? Not only because he works hard, but he he has a fine expression in in Portuguese. Wherever he goes, he speaks fluently, and this is something that we have to take care. 
Our people, our physicians, they have to learn to express in Portuguese. Of course, Marina knows how to do it very well, but the thesis is a moment when you can uh, appreciate the expression of uh, somebody. And for me, I always finish in Portuguese. Meu português é extremamente escorreito. E na medida que eu uso meu português fluentemente e escorreito, eu posso conseguir o melhor do que eu quero dizer na minha língua. Parabéns a você, Marina. Parabéns aos seus pais. Obrigado. Uh, Júnior, então, eu vou iniciar a resposta aqui antes do próximo arguição. Né, da provocação que você fez, que é, com o seu alto nível de é, inteligência e de histórico de vida, você coloca muito bem essa questão do, do inglês. Né? É, mas eu vou responder em inglês para os outros colegas que estão aqui do exterior, para poder entender também. Uh, actually, the idea of uh, thesis in English uh, is because nowadays, the, especially after the pandemic, uh, the knowledge uh, is recognized now as uh, uh, global and the internal, internationalization and the fast um, you know, dissemination of the, the knowledge is very, very intense. And as everybody knows, English is the most recognized global language. So uh, it's hard for the US people that are here, especially Peter Gilbert, to understand Portuguese. It's hard for us to understand English. So as the final uh, objective of this, uh, I would say scientific section is to um, improve the relation between universities. Uh, this was a very intense discussion uh, inside the uh, post-graduation of the our university. Should we allow presentations of thesis in English and uh, arguments as you did and arguments as, as I am doing now uh, we're uh, together as part of the academic thoughts and the conclusion is that uh, based on the objectives uh, of the research uh, we may uh, make uh, thesis in English after the approval of the post-graduation of the uh, Federal University of Sao Paulo which we did for this because we have a major objective with this the interaction between different institutions uh, different people Mitchell is here uh, also Mitchell is uh, uh, he developed a wrist rest device who is uh, used worldwide and decrease the uh, tre tremor of the surgeon and improve the performance uh, and we are going to work together with him in order to uh, improve this uh, invention and uh, when you put everything in a bag actually uh, it's very important at the end of the day that the research uh, be useful for more people we can uh, around the world. And we can do this, especially in this uh, particular situation, which occurred here in our department three times. This is the third thesis uh, or second thesis, I'm not sure. I think it's the third in English. Uh, for this reason, there is an exception uh, for the post-graduation of the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Occasion or so, uh, this is our reply, and my reply is a reply of the Federal University of São Paulo, not only of the Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, and I don't know if you agree or if, if you disagree with these points. However, this is the reason that we choose it for this thesis to make it in English. Okay, I, I agree in part. 
Uh, I still think that uh, we're here also to test the power and the capacity of expression of the candidate, but I uh, understand. And please, Marina, uh, I would like to uh, hear your comments. Yeah, sure. So, okay, so I took some notes here based on what you said before. Uh, as Dr. Mauricio said, we try to include some other institutions, especially American institutions. So this is the only way we found to, to make the, this presentation and this event presented in English. I tried to teach Dr. Gelbach a little bit of Portuguese and Dr. Mitch, but it didn't work that well. So still we need to present in English, but he's practicing, so it's fine. One day we are gonna get there. So this is uh, regarding the English part. And of course, it was harder for me because my native language is Portuguese, but still we thought that doing by this way, we could connect more people and involve more people in this presentation. So this is the first point. The second point, uh, I don't know if you had contact with IC Simulator before, but yeah, it's a pretty interesting platform. And I agree with you that it's not only about hand dexterity, but when you use IC, there is also a, stra a strategy approach. So you have different options in order to complete your, your test. So for instance, we use uh, a retinal membrane peeling as one of our tests. So you have the possibility to like to peel in a certain way or like you can choose in between many options which are available on the simulator. So of course it's not, uh, uh, it does not reproduce exactly what we have in the real OR experience, but still there is kind of strategy uh, approach to in this kind of, of software. And this is why we chose the, the IC, which is the, the best we have for now in terms of the VR uh, surgical simulators. So this is regarding the strategy. Uh, talking about age, I totally agree with you. And if you notice uh, in the first paragraph of each uh, result session, we do have the age of all participants that were involved in all the three papers. As you said, we also have the, the body mass index because we also think that this can, is something that could uh, uh, affect the final results. So we have uh, uh, reported this kind of information and all of them were like pretty similar because in Brazil, the fellows that we had at that time were almost like the same age. And also for the cocaine papers, there was no, not, not a big difference in between uh, uh, people that we recruited. And talking about alcohol time, uh, it was not about time, you know, when we analyzed the alcohol effect. As we said, it was about the BAC. So we just wait for the person to reach that specific BAC. And uh, it depends on the personal metabolism that uh, some people can take longer or shorter to reach the specific point. Uh, so, because uh, otherwise it would not be uh, as we were trying to make it weight adjusted. And the only way to weight adjust the alcohol exposure was to use the brief analyzer, uh, the, the brief alcohol concentration instead of the time. So it was a different approach as compared to the propanol and a caffeine intake. Not about time, but about brief alcohol concentration. Uh, for alcohol, you were totally right. Uh, alcohol was, uh, when we take all the variables we analyze in our study, alcohol was the one who was totally, uh, there was a direct correlation in between the alcohol intake and the performance, uh, like a negative actually a correlation. So, which we didn't see uh, with caffeine, for instance. So the, the higher the uh, alcohol intake you had, the worst were, was your performance. And now we are uh, uh, designing a protocol, as you say, to analyze the, the hangover, right? The, the, if you ate alcohol before the procedure, how are you gonna be on the next day? So we are already working on that. Uh, for exercise and sleep deprivation, we use a short session of physical exercise and one night of sleep deprivation. So maybe we were thinking that 
if the person was exposed to a long session of exercise instead of like a couple of minutes or a chronic uh, period of sleep deprivation, meaning maybe a week or something, then maybe we could find an impact on surgical dexterity. But since we did not perform this kind of analysis, we, we cannot say. I, I just can uh, state that a short session or uh, one night of sleep deprivation did not affect our performance, which I think is something valuable, you know, even in terms of legal, uh, a legal approach, because uh, if you are uh, uh, on call on the next night, and then you had a bad surgical outcome on the next day, may, the, the patient cannot say, oh, but I, I'm not seeing well, just because the, the doctor worked during the whole night the day before. And indeed, based on these data, we can say that there is no such a correlation between sleep deprivation of one night and a worse surgical outcome for the, the patient. And uh, for the caffeine, so this is a great point. Uh, on my talk, I said that uh, we excluded people which had a, a caffeine intake greater than two cups a day. So you would not be selected for my protocol at all if you take two, more than two coffees a day. And this is why, as you said, because uh, we know that people who usually take coffee every day, if they do not take a cup of coffee before the procedure, then the tremor amount goes up. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, you are not addicted, but you are used to this kind of exposure. That's why we just selected people who are uh, coffee naive uh, people, which are not used to take a lot of coffee, at least routine coffee every day. And uh, as we said already, uh, regarding alcohol, uh, it was not about time. It, it was about reaching the specific BAC to, uh, uh, to be ordered to, in, in order to be ready to perform the analysis. And thanks so much yeah, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Junior, you are satisfied? Very much, thank you. <laughs> so thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the comments. Uh, this, uh, the comments and also the uh, reflection about our uh, native language. It's very important. It was very, very, very long discussions in our post-graduation. Uh, so actually following our uh, uh, alphabetic names. <laughs> I would like to invite here now Professor uh, Marcio Pitarne Remy, who is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology of uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais. So Marcio, please go ahead and thanks for joining us. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Mauricio. First of all, I would like to thank my dear friends Mauricio Maia, Michel Farah, and Rubens before, as well as the UNIFESP for the honorable invitation. It's always a pleasure to participate in these academic activities of this university. Uh, <clears throat> Marina, this is a very interesting study and relevant and of a wide interest, not only for vitro retinal surgery, but also for ophthalmology and for general surgery as well. I would like to congratulate you, you, Marina, on your excellent study, which was very well planned and careful performed. And here I congratulate your advisor and your co-advisors, but in particular, Mauricio Maia, your advisor, for the safe, intelligent planning and the orientation of this study. The quality of your work is evidenced in this volume that you, you sent to us of your thesis, which puts together all of your results of your three papers. Uh, but it's also evident by the publication of the three papers in the important scientific journals, which demonstrates the quality of the, and the interest of your study. Uh, the doctorate thesis, uh, the PhD thesis, as we know, is a type of scientific work that raises, poses, and solves problems argues and presents reasons based on evidence of facts uh, with the purpose of providing whether the raised hypotheses are false or true. Regarding your thesis itself, 
Your introduction provides a good overview of your research, places it well and delimits the subject to be covered, avoiding unnecessary dig the digressions. The purpose is clear. Uh, the literature review, you demonstrate knowledge and familiarity with published works related to your thesis, summarizing them in an, an objective and concise manner, very useful for us that uh, see the, the, <clears throat> this subject for to have a good idea about its, how, how important it is. Your methodology is well described. It's complete and clear, and the results are presented in detail. The tables are clear, complete, and highly explanatory. Uh, the discussion, you compare your findings well with the data from the literature, and you provide a very nice discussion concerning the differences you find in your paper itself, in your studies, uh, comparing with different studies, sometimes with different results. But you look for an explanation how to discuss differences in methodology, in the sample. Uh, and so this gave you, um, gave us a, a very nice um, uh, opportunity to compare all these topics. And the references, uh, of course, are very well done and very complete. But I would like to, to ask you just a few questions. Now, so, uh, I would like to go to the, the thesis itself and, and the, the thesis that you sent to us in the page, um, just one moment here, page 32, 31. Can we go there? <clears throat> uh, sure, it, it, yeah. should, it should not be a time to, to ask you some questions. We're a very nice paper, but just to, to have here, you put uh, before the results in the last paragraph of statistical analysis, you put um, as, just to, to, to clarify for me, as <clears throat> per, uh, per the analysis, the difference in median, median, medians were calculated as medians on day one minus day two median, uh, minus day two, median day one, and less, day two, and not median for day one, minus median day two. Well, I would like to, to clarify better, to listen from you how, what does it really mean, this, these phrases? So, yeah, this is a, go a good point. So uh, uh, you are talking about the JAMA paper, right? Yes, JAMA paper, yes. Okay, paper, okay, yes. okay, yes. perfect. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so what we wanted to say here is that uh, we uh, perform a pair analysis. So first we subtract the performance of day two minus the performance of day one, and then we took the, the median value because uh, the opposite would be to have a median for day one and a median for day two, and then to subtract both values. And the main goal here is to perform like, because each subject has a specific dexterity and we did not want to compare in between subjects. You know what I mean? We just wanted to compare the performance of each person separately. So this is why we just subtract the difference in the score in between the two days for the same person. And then after that, we took the median value of all those differences. Uh, it's okay. Thank you. Um, also, uh, in the, the next the paragraph, in, in the results, um, you put systemic uh, in the last uh, four phrases of the first paragraph. Systemic, um, there were no difference in demographic characteristics of daily caffeine intake. Systemic blood pressure and head Heart rate were measured before and after external exposure, and the values were always equal or above 1, 120 plus 480 millimeters of mercury for blood pressure. All patients, the, the uh, systemic arterial pressure was above one, 120 to 480. Is this information right? Is it? Systemic yeah. blood pressure for every yeah. patient? 
Yeah, because well, it was equal okay. or above, because we were pretty afraid, afraid of the propanol effect, you know, because we are uh, we are aware of caffeine and we know there are not big uh, issues about taking caffeine, but about propanol, we did not know the personal answer uh, that each person was gonna have to the propanol intake. So we just wanted to assure that the the blood pressure would not go down uh, after this specific exposure. This was measured before or after taking the propanolol? So we make like a pilot study before the study, and then the, the blood pressure was measured after the propanolol intake. Okay, that's very nice. <clears throat> and going look ahead and say, in the discussion in the page 821 of the JAMA, the, the, the last phrase that the current results provide supporting evidence for avoiding even low dose caffeine in the hours before performing surgical procedures by non habitual caffeine users in maintain overall performance capability. Very strong phrase. <clears throat> I would like to, to listen from you. Uh, you exclude first the, the first question is you gave caffeine 2.5 uh, milligrams per kilograms after 30 minutes you gave 5 5.0 milligrams no 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 we established two cutoffs so first we use the 2.5 and then the person would go to the simulator and do the third uh, simulation of that day and the second cutoff was the high dose, meaning uh, an additional dose of 2.5 milligrams per kilo in a total of five milligrams per kilo. And then the following simulation was performed. But this second dose was mm -hmm. uh, in addition for the first dose or you have an interval between them? In addition, yeah. Uh, so the total dose was, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, so the additional dose was, was 2.5, meaning a total of five milligrams per kilo. You know what I mean? The first one was uh, 2.5, and then an additional of 2.5 in a total of five milligrams total per kilo. Total of five, uh, yes. Yeah. So it's not seven and five. No, seven. no, no, it's too five. much, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> Very interesting. And also, it, you said, uh, you also, it's very interesting the discussion about if you have an exclusion criteria, the people that drink a lot of coffee. On the other hand, you don't suggest the people that drink regular quantities of coffee that stop drinking coffee because you are afraid of having other effects of suppressing the, the, the caffeine. But how could you? Manage how do you believe you can uh, just as suggestion and to to be provocative, if you can dose the the caffeine in the blood would be more precise than uh, only take because some colleagues some doctors drink their regular cough could be much higher than the others or on the limit of eight ounces as you you you, you talk, do you believe you can dose the caffeine in the blood? instead of just taking, uh, say, to say one cup or two cups? To... Yeah, this is a, a good point. Uh, I've never heard, I'm, I'm not aware of a blood exam that is able to, uh, to dose the caffeine uh, in the blood, maybe an indirect uh, factor of the caffeine, but not the caffeine in the, as the substance. But I, the point I want to emphasize is not about the concentration of the caffeine in the blood, it's more about the receptors. Because people who are used to a caffeine intake every day, they probably have uh, an adjustment of the amount of receptors they have for an adrenergic uh, stimulus. You know what I mean? So uh, it, it's not about just the intake, it's about the metabolism and about how your body is used to have this coffee intake every day. So I don't think 
it, it would make a big difference. And this is why also we try to select a homogeneous group of people with a lower caffeine intake in order to avoid bias due to those factors that you were mentioning now. Oh, your study is, is excellent and it's very practical. You gave an idea how much coffee we drink in now, or usually we drink it. This is very important. But you, you use the, the blood concentration for alcohol, for example. You don't, you don't use only one cup or two cups, just to, to have a good comparison. But uh, of course, we understand completely this. There's no problem. Another question, I was really intrigued in that the, the, the amount of caffeine in, in regular coffee is around uh, uh, one ounce. Um, it would be something like 450 millimeters of coffee. Right? It's a lot of regular coffee if you use not, not espresso coffee. Comparing with only one cup of coffee uh, of espresso, it seems that the, there's a big difference in the concentration of espresso coffee and a, a, a regular um, boiled coffee that I don't, you, you use the term exactly. But if you use uh, a cup of coffee, it would be 250 millimeters and it, it would be almost a low dose it would, would correspond to one five, seven millimeters, uh, milligrams uh, for a, um, a person of 70 kilograms. And this would be in a cup of um, almost around 20, 26 ml of coffee. That's much more than a cup of coffee. So uh, I would like to listen from you. you. You probably use these references from American FDA, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the amount of caffeine in regular coffee, not, not espresso coffee. And uh, is this the same amount of coffee used here in Brazil in the patients you use to, to prepare the coffees? This, just to compare, it seems to me very different concentration of coffee in regular coffee and a cup of coffee of espresso coffee. But I would like to listen from you uh, about this, this subject. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, regarding the coffee concentration, uh, the 2.5 milligrams per kilo of caffeine uh, was equal to 25 milliliters cup of espresso or a eight ounce cup of drip or percolated coffee. Um, so this, uh, the espresso concentration is the same all over. There is no difference in the comparison between Brazil or US, for instance. And uh, as you said, there are not many studies uh, on this specific concentration. So we decided to take a study uh, which used the same concentration before, but the analysis was totally different. And I'll check here, but this study was published, uh, I remember it was like a long time ago. It was published in, yeah, yeah, it was like 10 years ago, this study, this study was published and we tried to repeat the same measure. But uh, yes, uh, we believe that like our high dose of five milligrams per kilo of caffeine was equivalent to two cups of espresso, which was not that much, but a problem we had was that the protocol was performed at night. So many people uh, complain about not sleeping on that night just because it was very <laughs> close to, to the time going to bed. But I believe that during the days, maybe people would not feel the, the, the sensation of the caffeine, but still they were gonna have maybe an impact on their surgical dexterity on that morning. It's very interesting, but I was really intrigued because of the large difference. For regular coffee, you could drink almost 450 ml of coffee, uh, comparing with just two cups of coffee of espresso. Uh, I, and this, just to be provocative, is our coffee is prepared in a different way from American coffee, and these references are usually done by American, you take from into uh, American uh, FDA probably and the, the papers are, are also probably based on 
coffee prepared in American way. There is very different from us, but this is just to be to consider for now others, other studies that you are <clears throat> going every, uh, extending your, your understanding of this subject. But just to, uh, is uh, my interesting thing to know. And uh, also, uh, I would like, do you have an idea, for, for example, if you drink a coffee, how long have you have to wait until you have to, the, 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 this coffee, this concentration uh, should go away? So should you not perform because you did the, the coffee 30 minutes before? For example, if you go four hours later, five hours, six hours, what would be the, the, the elimination of the coffee from brood? Do you have an idea how long should we have to, to wait? Yeah, so this is a great point. Uh, we have available in the literature the data that shows that the peak, uh, the blood peak, is reached in about 30 to 60 minutes. So this is why we use this number for our study. Uh, but the, of course, this is an average. This is not like it depends on each person and uh, on the weight and so on. But for you to get release of the coffee effect, this is a great point. I just don't know. The, the, and, and I think there is no previous study showing that. So maybe this can be a next step for our group to validate, because this is a great point for a person to be aware of. For now on, I'm OK. I, I don't have like any effect of the caffeine in my body. Yeah, thanks for the idea for the next study. <laughs> yeah, and finally, I would like again to congratulate you you and, and your family, and especially your parents, Jane, our good friend, Sueli, who shared with you the difficulties, tensions, emotions, and learnings during the preparation of this excellent study. Congratulations, and thank you for the, the invitation and for the opportunity to participate in this session with such distinguished colleagues. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, Professor Marcio. I would like to know if you are okay with the replies. Are you satisfied? Yes. So Absolutely. thanks a lot Thank you. for your help. Okay. So uh, to finish the, our session, I would like to invite uh, Professor Marcos Pereira de Avila, uh, which is uh, head of the um, Department of Ophthalmology of uh, Federal University of Goiás. So my friend Marcos, please go ahead. The word is yours. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Maurice. Marina, what a thesis, huh? Fantastic. Excellent work. Congratulations. Uh, I would like to congratulate Arthur. Now I see that he's already your husband. The, the thesis we received, he was your fiance. Now he's your husband. As you mentioned in your, in your presentation, uh, your parents, my friend Jamie and Sueli, your brother Arnaldo, the committee members that I have the honor to be here when, this morning, Peter Gelbach, Carlos Augusto Moreira Jr., Márcio Nehemi, Otaviano Magalhães Jr., and Sérgio Pimentel. Logico, uh, it's a pleasure to be with them and with your co-advisors, our big friend Michel Fará and our also big friend Rubens Belfort, who were all your co-advisors. Your advisor, the, the master Mauricio Maia, the president of Brazilian Society of Retina and Vitreous. We all uh, very happy to be here. Marina, I learned a lot from your work. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, lots of uh, new things and not lots of uh, new information you study a very, very important subject, as we all know, and as, as all of us already mentioned before in their, uh, their questions. You presented a PhD thesis uh, with already three published works, uh, three published papers, me, I mean, in a very important, uh, uh, very uh, in high impact uh, uh, journals. And, I, and as I said, it's very impressive, your work. Uh, your presentation was outstanding. And I also think like Moreira a little bit, if we have two versions, in one in Portuguese and one in English, of course, Peter, 
uh, needs a, a version in English. Uh, uh, but if we had a, one version in Portuguese, it would be nice because lots of people uh, would, would like to see your work. The structure of your thesis is it's a, it's a very impressive, very well written. The introduction, objectives. The object, I, 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 I thought that the way you presented it was very good. Three studies. Uh, you, you, then the publications, uh, you presented the publications in the, in the paper. The discussion, I think the reader of your, 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 your work, uh, we, we liked a lot because you, you kind of compiled all the information in five topics, the caffeine plus propanolog, alcohol consumption, physical exercise, sleep depri deprivation, and cocaine. Uh, so it's, it's all in there. It's, it's very easy. It's, it people, we, we, we learn a lot reading your discussion. And the conclusions, you mentioned study one, two, and three, and then you have the reference. I think it's very, very well written. You, you, you did a, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you spend nights and nights correcting and training and doing and doing, redoing it. Uh, but it's perfect work. I have nothing to, to add. I have not, I don't, didn't see uh, anything that uh, we could bet. Unless, uh, just take a, in item number four, there is discussions. I think the S, it's not necessary. Just take a look, take a look at that. So Marina, I think it's, it's very relevant in the, the, in the microsurgery environment. Uh, the ophthalmological community, uh, worldwide, we benefit from your work for sure. This is a, this is something that uh, Peter mentioned, Marcio and Moreira. Uh, it's the ophthalmological community worldwide. We really benefit from your work. The the methodology used uh, sure could be tested for uh, as you tested for external factors uh, related to surgical skills and mostly to ability. And I, I, I have a question for you. I have, it's very simple. The, many of the questions I had, you already answered. I had some questions on coffee, but uh, you have a, an expert in coffee. Uh, Marcio Nehem is an expert in coffee. He, he appreciates coffee and I, he knows a lot about coffee. So he had many questions to you. Uh, we, have, uh, we are friends since uh, our lifetime. And uh, he, he teach me, teaches, me, teach, teaches me a lot about coffee. But the question I have for you is, do you think your methodology could be used as part of uh, a demission uh, in, the, in our residence programs? Do you think uh, we should have a, your test before the, a person starts ophthalmology in our residency programs? Yeah. This is a, a good point. So uh, actually, uh, the simulator, the IC simulator, professor, is already being used at least in Sao Paulo for the uh, for uh, resident and fellowship programs as part of the the exam for you to enter the program. Uh, my opinion about that, I think is a little bit tricky, this kind of approach, because I have two points to mention about this subject. So first, uh, there is a learning curve intrinsic to the, to the simulator. So this is why we chose people with more than two hours of surgical experience with ICE. So we ask people to come at, uh, on another day just to get used to the platform. So this is the first point. And as you know, there are many people who feel stress when they are being evaluated. Uh, we have this kind of experience with ingenuity, for instance. There are people who have a worse performance when people are around seeing the same scene, uh, the surgical scenario uh, as you are. So uh, maybe you can uh, give a bad feedback and to consider the surgeon as a bad, uh, with a, a bad ability, like hand ability just because he is not performing well in a situation, in a scenario that he is being evaluated. So these are the two points that I want to emphasize that can potentially bias this kind of approach. Okay. Uh, and the, the same methodology, I think, it, the, the, I, I think Moreira touched the subject. I was curious to know if, if the same methodology could be tested for senior surgeons that have a lot of experience already. 
I think that's a very, very important point, not only for training, but, but for testing ability. What do you think? So we are actually doing that already. <laughs> we have a paper. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. we did the same because this was a question we had. Uh, what we saw for now is that the influence of those factors on senior surgeons are not the same as junior surgeons. So they have a lower impact based on all those exposures uh, in terms of total score, meaning that probably the final result would be the same. But we, we saw a difference in the tremor amount. So they had a higher, although they had a higher tremor amount when exposed, for instance, to alcohol or caffeine, their total score were just like the same, different from the junior surgeons who had a worse total score. So maybe they have mechanism, they have ways to compensate this kind of external exposure based on their personal experience. Okay. I, I like a lot the table one. Table one is it's fantastic. You had a lot of work to summarize everything in table one. Uh, and, uh, but before uh, asking, uh, this is my uh, last comment, uh, but before asking some uh, things on, on table one, I, I'm going to read your conclusions that you presented a few minutes ago. Study one, novice vitro retina surgeons who ingest 5.0 milligram per, ki per kilo of caffeine before performing a surgical procedure may benefit from receiving a partially neutralizing dose, dose of 0.5 milligram per, per kilo of propanolol. This is the conclusion in stat number one. Stat number two, there was a dose-dependent alcohol effect on performance. Why I'm reading that, their conclusion? Because then I'm going to discuss the, the table one with you. Another okay. conclusion from study two, the study two, the beneficial propanolol association with surgical dexterity was evident when compared to impairment after cocaine, excuse me, after caffeine and or alcohol. The final conclusion in study two is there was no change in surgical performance after acute, is, acute sleeping deprivation or after a short session of upper limb physical exercise. Okay, I'm not going to read the conclusions uh, on study three because this cocaine it was not it was done in non surgeons, but when I read table one, it's uh, I think we in in, in some at some, some point maybe you should explore a little bit more table one because most of uh, the, the the information that we read in the, the table are caffeine. You had two papers on caffeine. Correct. Yeah. There was the, the, you can classify the information as negative, positive, and neutral. Negative mm -hmm. two. So caffeine worse performance as far as surgery, as you mentioned already. Beta blocker positive in one, neutral in one, and negative in one. Exercise negative in three. It's a little bit different from your conclusions. I mean, you yeah. see, uh, the uh, sleep deprivation. You have 34 papers. Exercise uh, is uh, in, in, in sleep deprivation. 21 were neutral. 12 were negative, which means that exercise, sleep deprivation would perform uh, in a negative way during uh, during surgery for the surgeon regarding its ability. And it was positive in one. I, this is, was a little bit. So 34 papers. Alcohol. Alcohol was interesting. You have neutral in one, negative in two, and then one paper uh, uh, study the amount of glasses. One glasses one glass was neutral. Three to six glasses, as Moreira happened to Moreira in Chile, was negative. And then you have caffeine plus exercise was neutral. Neutral, caffeine plus sleep deprivation neutral in one. 
caffeine plus beta blocker. It's a mix of, uh, of uh, conclusions, caffeine negative and blocker positive. And finally, alcohol plus sleep deprivation. Alcohol plus sleep deprivation was negative in three. Yeah. So, and was neutral in one. So my point here is, uh, do you think you could explore more the literature to combine and, and, to, and uh, to combine with your findings and have a, a, a more a better perspective of your of your of our data? Yeah, yeah, th this is a great point. So as you said, there are many works in the literature, but no one is comparing all those factors on the same surgeon first. And in this table, I included uh, uh, all specialties in medicine. So it's not only about ophthalmology, it's about like general surgery. And it, sometimes it's not about surgery at all. It's just about, for instance, holding a pointer on a specific target. Uh, that's why I, I thought it was sometimes hard for me to compare my data with the other studies data because there was a totally different methodology. For instance, as you said, there is a paper showing that if you are sleep deprived, you are gonna have a better performance. So probably there is something about the methodology because it's not a rational uh, conclusion that you can obtain in this kind of protocol. Uh, this is why I tried to select the papers that were, were more uh, similar. The methodology was kind of similar to ours in order to compare like bananas with bananas. You know what I mean? Otherwise, I, I was going to be comparing uh, apples with bananas and I, it's hard for you to take uh, to obtain the same conclusion. But I just want to list everything that is available in the literature. And, and it's a uh, there are papers from like 30 years ago, so uh, many things changes since then, and the IC simulator, for instance, is a great way for you to obtain those data, and the majority of those studies are, don't have such a good uh, 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 precise uh, simulation platform to, to obtain the data. I don't know if I answer your questions. Uh, you, you, yeah. you, did, you did answer. That's the question. I was, that was the answer I was expecting. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to compare uh, since uh, you, you and uh, you, the, uh, many, most of the papers were in known uh, with were in other specialties, uh, uh, not in ophthalmology. Okay, Marina, congratulations. Uh, you did a very good job. Keep doing a good job and uh, keep uh, exploring, exploring uh, this uh, this line of research here in Brazil. You're going to be leader worldwide in uh, and testing uh, surgeon surgeons skills and ability in uh, in uh, in ophthalmological surgery, especially in retina visual retina surgery. Congratulations, Marina. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Marcus. Uh, Marcus, I would like to know if you're uh, okay, if you're satisfied with the replies from Marina. Plenty. Okay. So after Thank we go, so thanks a lot, my friend. Uh, actually, uh, before we go to, to the other room, uh, I would like to, to, to say some words about Marina, okay? I think it's very important for everybody here, uh, for people we are 40, 39 people connected here. Uh, many people are, are in the, our post-graduation program. And I learned a lot with Marina during this time. Okay? I learned with uh, her efforts and uh, uh, desire and to, to, to do things and to contribute with, with science. So actually, um, the character of uh, the candidate Marina is uh, fantastic. And I believe uh, your parents, Sueli, uh, all the parents, Sueli, uh, Jaime, Arthur, uh, Arnaldo, if I'm not wrong, <laughs> Silvia also, everybody should be very proud of Marina. Marina is a fantastic person and uh, she she it would be impossible to 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 bring marina uh, until this position 
if she uh, were a different person uh, with a different kind of character. So despite the pandemic, despite everything, she uh, finished everything. She lost many days doing this. Uh, actually, everybody knows that was very difficult. People here in our department uh, helped her a lot, but uh, for sure she was, uh, uh, she had a, a strong tenacity in order to finish this. Uh, actually, um, I believe um, this high level of publications, high level of um, uh, actually uh, presentations in meetings and also many uh, international interviews that she did in the ASRS, in I, etc., shows the importance of her work that I believe goes beyond the ophthalmology, goes to microsurgery in general, or even surgery in general. Uh, this uh, not should be possible without a high level of scientific uh, reability, which is a consequence of the high level of the character uh, of Marina. So congratulations, Marina, for everything. I would like to uh, also in Brazil, which we have uh, some dogmas here, that the public-private relationship uh, for the financial support, as we can see here uh, in the coordination of improvement of higher education personnel, uh, actually uh, our uh, CAPS, uh, the National Council of Scientific and Technological Development, the CMPT, uh, and also the Vision Institute, uh, and here, uh, Professor Rubens Belfort was very important in order to, uh, all, to do all of this. Uh, the connection with Latino Pharma or Cristalia company, a private company, which Professor Ana Luisa and Michel Fará did a fantastic job in order to make this possible. And also the Lemon Foundation, uh, which also Professor Rubens Belfort made the connections and made all of this possible. So. Uh, the message here is that we should think uh, out of the box. Uh, we should not only depend of the federal government. The Brazilian University, as uh, uh, Carlos Moreira Jr., uh, Professor Carlos Moreira Jr. pointed out, should think out of the box. This discussion about Portuguese and English native uh, language and everything is very important, but uh, more important than that, I believe, is uh, to uh, bring, as the colleagues from U.S. do, uh, financial resources uh, from the third sector of the economy, from the private companies and everything, and make this relation of the university and companies uh, more, um, you know, uh, more near as possible, more close as possible. We don't do this in Brazil, and we should do this in order to improve our science. Uh, for the end of the day, we improve the results of our science for our patients. Uh, I've learned a lot with Marina, who motivated our uh, department, especially the vitro-retinal unit, uh, and uh, people helped a lot with uh, uh, all these studies that were very, very time consuming. The future directions uh, here, Mitchell, no, not our Michel Farah, but Mitchell Wolf from US. Uh, we are going to, to do some collaborative studies uh, with him and maybe with comp other companies and uh, study the next step, the study of the hangover which is the name which is the hand hangover. Uh, we are going to do that. This is very important because this reflects what happens in our practice, daily practice. I think this is an important point to be studied. Uh, they study to compare senior versus young surgeons. It's very important uh, to improve this. Uh, actually, they study of fatigue. Uh, in the end of the day, all the meetings we go, 
and people don't do don't, don't say that but they say ah this was the last surgery of the day i was not uh, when we have complications right well i was not so uh, focused in the surgery anymore etc 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 so i think this uh, fatigue and maybe we can uh, can give guidelines to perform surgery in half period instead of uh, the entire period for uh, microsurgery uh, should be another important uh, contribution for the science. And so we are going to explore these three fields. Uh, and I already had discussed this with Marina, with uh, also uh, Michel Farah and uh, other colleagues. And we believe this is very important. Um, at the end, I would like to, to, to tell uh everybody before we move to the other room that uh as uh, carlos augusto moreira jr who i did my fellowship always says uh, and he is a, a sentence a phrase from robert Ma robert mackmer uh who started the vitrectomy worldwide that improvement of things and science becomes from unconventional Okay, so Marina did unconventional things, thought out of the box, and uh, and I think this is the key uh, to improve science. So uh, finish my my words here. I would like to know if Marina, which is the star of the day, <laughs> would like to tell something before we go to the other room. Yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody. So I want to thank the committee members who are all over Brazil, uh, Marcio Nehemi, Marcos Avila, and Carlos Moreira Jr. I want to thank Dr. Gelbach for being by my side since like four years ago. Uh, uh, the, the other committee members, which are Sergio Pimentel and Otaviano, who are also together with us today. Uh, and all the volunteers of this project and uh, our, our, like, uh, as I said, Professor Julian, who is also, uh, also helped me in a guidance of this project and Dr. Mitch, who is like super excited about our work. We are also about uh, excited about his work, all my friends, and especially Dr. Mauricio Maya, who like proved me a way to go and, and like make this path uh, to, to, to be followed in a soft way because he is always showing the ways to deal with things, the best opening doors during this whole process. And he was like, fantastic, terrific during this whole process. And my co-advisors, Dr. Michelle Farah, who provided the simulator and the whole opportunity for me to do this research and Dr. Uh, Rubens Belfort, who is my mentor since medical school. So, so I, I have many friends. It's not uh, my work, it's like our work. Uh, and I thank all those mentors and friends involved in this process. So Marina, thanks a lot. And thanks for all the uh, Vitor Retinal uh, Unity, uh, people that helped a lot Marina uh to to do this study that will be very helpful worldwide michelle do you want to say some words well mauricio <laughs> uh congratulations to you as a mentor uh for the excellent uh work that uh, marina did with our supervision as well and uh, new knowledge is coming and uh, this line of research is uh, probably going to open several other lines uh, in a deeper way, uh, taking into consideration several of the comments uh, that the, our examiners did here. Uh, we can do better, we can go ahead with deeper information uh not only working with Mitchell as you mentioned but with Peter and other friends that are in the same uh same boat <laughs> uh going in that direction so thank you so much uh for your friendship and for your your leadership in this uh, in this thesis and Marina congratulations so thanks a lot and uh my my 
it's important to, to, to recognize uh, Sergio Pimentel, Otaviano Magalhães Jr. that were with us uh, since the beginning. Uh, they are not here anymore. And also Rodrigo Brandt and Rodrigo Meirelles, who are the, Rodrigo Brandt is the chief of our uh, vitro retinal uh, unit in, uh, now. Uh, and actually Rodrigo Brandt, who uh, made uh, this uh, session here possible. And uh, today we didn't have our uh, case discussion as we usually have. So I would like to ask, Eu queria é, pedir agora, eu like to ask to go to the other room. Eu queria solicitar agora para a Joelma nos colocar no outro, na outra sala, Joelma, para nós debatermos. A candidata, por favor, Joelma. Por gentileza, se você puder nos mover para outra sala. Uh, so, please, my friends, uh, click in ingressar. Ingressar in your uh, computer, please. Ô Marina, enquanto eles vão te dar a nota máxima aí, parabéns, viu? Uma defesa alto nível em inglês, parabéns, foi fantástico, tá? Ah, mas eu agradeço a senhora. Lembra que quando eu era residente, a senhora falava assim, eu não ouço nada o que você fala, fala em negrito, você não fala direito. Então, eu acho que graças à senhora, né? Foi anos assim tentando falar um pouco melhor e uma... Né? Assim, é uma vida né? de aprendizado, mas a senhora sempre me impulsionou, desde o R1, né? eu sou super grata, a senhora, é, assim como para mim, é uma mãe, né? para todos da, do guarda-chuva da, da Escola Paulista. Obrigada. Valeu muito a pena, Marina, porque foi bom mesmo, viu? Tudo, tudo, sua, sua aula, sua defesa realmente da, da sua tese, em tudo em inglês, quer dizer, isso aí... Valeu a pena eu pegar no seu pé, então. Parabéns, viu? Daqui a pouco eles vão entrar, então eu aproveitei essa brecha para falar com você. Ah, obrigada e obrigada por acreditar, né? Sempre na gente, desde o comecinho. É muito importante, né? Ter pessoas como a senhora que impulsionam a gente. Obrigada. Ô Marina, que é o Rodrigo. Parabéns, viu? É... Foi top mesmo. Fazer inglês não é fácil, não. É qualidade dos trabalhos, a apresentação foi top, então assim, é óbvio, vamos. você vai receber um 10 logo em seguida agora, quem já sabe, mas você tem que mostrar para todo mundo aí que dá para fazer, né? dá trabalho, mas dá para fazer e dá para fazer com qualidade, né? então agora, todo mundo que está assistindo aos telos, vocês têm que se espelhar na Marina aí, tá? pegar dicas com ela, pedir ajuda para saber como fazer com a qualidade desse tamanho aqui no Brasil, né? É, dá para fazer, dá um trabalhinho, né? demora um tempo, mas a coisa sai. Então, ó, parabéns mesmo, parabéns seus pais que estão aí também. Né? É, e vamos em frente, vamos fazer mais agora. Obrigada, Mineiro. Eu, eu acho que assim, é fruto da... Mostra a colaboração que a gente tem dentro da escola, né? Porque... Diferente de outros trabalhos, a minha amostra eram os nossos fellows e nossos cirurgiões seniors como você, que desmarcaram consultórias, eles chegaram a desmarcar a cirurgia para uh, me ajudar nesse projeto, sem nenhum incentivo, só em prol da colaboração. E eu acho que a gente que está na escola há muitos anos, né, desde o início da nossa formação médica, sabe que tem esse espírito de colaboração. Então, eu sou muito grata a, a todo mundo né, que me ajudou nesse processo, e eu acho que tem que, vamos nos manter publicando, né? Nós temos boas ideias, boa infraestrutura, eu acho que não tem porquê a gente não, não manter a nossa linha de pesquisa na escola. Obrigada pela, pela ajuda que você deu no projeto. Marina, parabéns também pelo, 
a calma quando deu um, um lá no seu computador, porque se fosse eu, acho que eu teria tido um infarto. Eu acho que entrou muita gente e aí o, o, o PowerPoint pifou. Mas tudo bem, foi bom que aí deu mais tempo, assim, né? A apresentação já deu uma ousa um pouco do tempo. Mas não estava previsto isso. Parabéns, Marina. Parabéns mesmo. Eu quero todas as dicas, viu? Pode deixar, querida. So now we are back here, uh, so I can change to Portuguese, ok? Uh, actually, to, todos podem me ouvir? Sim, Maurício, também. Então, então vamos lá. Essa frase eu preciso dizer em português como é praxe da nossa pós-graduação, norma da pós-graduação da Universidade Federal de São Paulo, em face aos referidos pareceres, né, que estão gravados, uh, a comissão julgadora considera a doutora Marina Rosenblatt 
habilitada a receber o título de doutor em ciências pela Universidade Federal de São Paulo e, por estarem de acordo, vão assinar a presente ata uh, via e-mail uh, os professores Carlos Augusto Moreira Júnior, uh, professor Márcio Pitarne Remi, professor Marcos Pereira de Ávila, professor Maurício Maia, e and professor Dr. Peter Luiz Gelbach, ou professor Dr. Peter Luiz, Luiz Gelbach. É, São Paulo, quinta-feira, 7 de outubro de 2021. Meus parabéns a Marina e toda a sua família. <risos> parabéns, Marina. Você, Marina, você quer falar algumas palavras? Por favor. Ah, eu não sei. Parabéns, Maria. Pode falar em português ou em inglês? Ah, Oi, Jaime. É... É... Vamos lá, Marina. É, eu quero agradecer. Foi um longo processo, assim, que envolveu muito esforço, mas assim, agora tudo parece fácil, né? Quando você chega no fim e as coisas se encaixam e você vê que tem muitas pessoas do teu lado, que você não está sozinho nessa trajetória, que é uma instituição de excelência e que a gente tem a honra, né? Eu, desde os meus 17 anos, eu estou na Escola Paulista e é sempre uma honra estar tá aqui e aumentar o networking e conhecer professores né, titulares de outros serviços e que uh, me ajudaram e que agora trouxeram pontos tão relevantes para para minha pesquisa e para nossa pesquisa, então eu acho que isso é só mais um legal da escada e que agora já tem que ter uma próxima meta, né? Eu estou muito contente de né, poder dividir com todos vocês esse momento e grata por tudo que, eu, que me ajudaram. Eu estou muito contente que você vai agora para o pós-doutorado, rapidamente, <risos> muito contente que você vai orientar as teses e que vai estar conosco aqui, dentro da universidade. Nós não podemos perdê-la, por favor. Não per podemos perdê-la para o seu marido. Você pode... Você pode se dedicar às duas coisas. É, mas ele, graças a Deus, lava, passa, cozinha, então dá tudo certo. <risos> essa foi boa, hein, Marina? Essa foi boa, bom? Gostei, meu. Muito boa, muito boa. Sueli, Sueli, que tanto nos ensina aí, Jaime, que tanto nos ensinou, não sei se vocês querem fazer algum comentário para nós, é uma emoção muito grande vocês terem dado de presente essa, essa pérola que é a Marina para todos nós. Por favor, fique à vontade de se expressar. Eu vou chamar, tá? Pode chamar. Na verdade, nós recebemos dois presentes, né? O Roberto Rosenblatt e a Marina Rosenblatt, né? Sim. Roberto veio antes. Bob é um grande amigo querido também, né? Vamos lá, Sueli, você que, você que ensinou, ensina tanta gente, nos ensina tanto, nos deu essa pérola que é a Marina. Você queria fazer algum comentário antes de nós fecharmos a sessão? O Jaime também, nós estamos muito emocionados aqui com tudo que a Marina fez e com o que ela vai fazer ainda é, no nosso setor, no nosso departamento de oftalmologia. Por favor, Sueli. Um, I would like to thank you, particularly Dr. Maurício Maia, because you were the key person in the development of Marina in the scientific field. She is, of course, starting a new way of life professionally and also in her private life. But you were a key person, not only a professor, but a friend. You made, it, uh, made her to develop, to get mature. And I think that you wouldn't be able to complete the study if you could, if you didn't have patience and help her and forgive her of the mistakes she has done and 
continue to love her because I know that you love her. And it's very important for a, a, a professor to love the student. And uh, I think that it was very important, this partnership. And she learned a lot and we learned a lot with you. Thank you, Dr. Mauricio. Please, doctor, don't make me cry. <laughs> but you know, I know all the steps she had to follow in this uh, process, and you helped her and helped her a lot, not only professionally, but only uh, teaching her how to behave and how to deal with patients, colleagues. You are, you are a very a very important person and a very good uh, orientator, how can mentor. I say? Mentor. Mentor. Very, very good mentor. Uh, uh, you are, congratulations. You are very great, Dr. Mauricio. Thank you a lot. Well, it means that Mauricio learned. <laughs> yes, Mauricio is a particularly a very good person. I'm very proud that Mauricio yes. learned how to do it. Yes. And Dr. Gelbach also, if he is here, he also was very, very important during Marina's stay in the Johns Hopkins and all the other professors I would like to congratulate also, but particularly Dr. Mauricio Meyer. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Dr. Mauricio. We are thankful. We are thankful to, 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 to have the opportunity to have Marina with us. Thanks a lot for everything, okay? Jaime, please. Yes. Uh, can please, you hear Jaime. me? Yes. Can you hear? Okay. I, I would like to make uh, Sue Lee words, mine words, to thank all the people that help Marina uh since the time of uh, residency all the professors the mentors the uh, wonderful experience she had at baltimore uh to thank especially dr gelbach and all the colleagues at uh, the wilmer uh she had you know such a beautiful you know, uh, opportunity over there and of course, all the, the training she had uh, during her residency, and especially, especially for you, Mauricio. You are, you, you are a great guy. You are an excellent, you are the, an excellent person. And all the friends, that uh, were here today uh, uh, judging Marina's thesis. Uh, and uh, I want to appreciate, I, I don't say that I'm going to take alcohol with all the friends, but at least a cup of coffee at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much and congratulations. Congratulations, Marina. You have a beautiful path ahead of you. Thank you. Acaba com Marjol Tov para todos vocês. Eu vou indo. Tchau, tchau. Marjol Tov. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Marina. Parabéns. Um abraço a todos. Tá? Fiquem com Deus. Ô Maurício, mas o Arthur não vai falar para a esposa, não? Nada. O Arthur tem que falar alguma coisa. Não, não. Cara, eu... Vocês querem que eu fale, eu falo. Estava aqui me posicionando Olá, apenas. Faltou o Arthur, não tinha visto aqui. No... Deixa eu pôr, visualizar todos aqui. Galeria. Eu tô, estou tô aqui no meio do escritório também. É, não posso. Está meio ruim de ligar a câmera aqui. Estou tentando. Fiquei calado aqui, só aplaudindo aí as observações, né? Mas estamos muito felizes, assim, muito orgulhosos do trabalho. É, eu pude acompanhar de perto aí o esforço que Marina realizou né, para terminar todo esse, essa, esse grande projeto. E, sem dúvida nenhuma, é, é impressionante, não só porque sou ali sou a pessoa que está constantemente ao lado dela, é impressionante a resiliência, a força de vontade, a ambição. Né? Os vários fins de semana que eu tive que ficar ali é, acompanhando para que esse trabalho muito bem feito fosse realizado. 
né? E, logicamente, todos vocês que ajudaram, porque em tudo na vida, né? em qualquer área, eu que sou da área de negócio, administração, mas na área de medicina e outras áreas, nós não construímos nada sozinhos, né? nós só fazemos coisas grandes com grandes pessoas ao lado. Apesar que, às vezes, o nosso sistema e a nossa mídia coloca uma pessoa na capa, mas, na verdade, naquela revista tem milhares de pessoas e dezenas de pessoas atrás de, às vezes, uma pessoa que aparece sozinha na capa. Né? então não há vitória sozinha, há vitória de um grande time, então agradecer a todos vocês por ajudar é, e contribuir com a realização de um grandíssimo trabalho. Então, parabéns, parabéns Marina, parabéns a todos, e vamos ao próximo desafio. Muito obrigado a todos e grande abraço. Vou ter uma foto aqui de todos nós, muito obrigado a todos. Fiquem com Deus, parabéns Marina e vamos adiante. Um grande abraço a todos aí. Fiquem com Deus. Abraço, abraço. É, abraço, bem. Até mais, obrigado, obrigado a todos. Abraço, abraço. Peter, well, nice to see you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, nice to meet you again, Dr. Peter. <laughs>